you called a friend, but that person really never has done anything for you? Probably most of us have individuals in our lives like that. Really, rather than being a friend, we might be more accurate just to refer to them as an associate. Because you see, in order for one to be a friend, he needs to pass some tests of friendship, doesn't he? Folks, individuals who are true friends have proved their friendship to us over and over again. Individuals who are of our friends are there when we have experienced some of our deepest losses. Those who are truly our friends have stuck by us when we ourselves were at our very worst. A true friend is one who seeks to protect us from evil. Our friends have supported us when we were in need. A true friend listens to us when we have all of our complaints and all of our gripes that need to be aired. The title of our lesson this morning is this. Jesus is our friend. But notice the subtitle, and He proves it. Before we enter into the lesson though, I want us to ask a question. Who is Jesus? Now, for all of us in this audience, we know who Jesus is, don't we? Sometimes, however, it is good for us to be reminded of exactly who this person that refers to himself as our friend is. Number one, he is God. John 1 verse 1. Not only is he God, but he is the second member of the Godhead. Romans 15 verse 30. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. He is the creator of all things. John 1 verse 3. He took upon Himself the form of a man and lived on earth as a man. John 1.14, Philippians 2, verses 5-8. through We find that He died upon the cross of Calvary in order to forgive us of our sins. 1 Corinthians 15.3 He rose the third day from the grave, victorious over death, victorious over the Hadean realm. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 4. We find, too, that He now sits at the right hand of the throne of God. And there He rules as King of kings and Lord of lords. Acts 2 verse 37. And my friends, it is He who is the mediator of the New Testament. You see, when we think about Jesus, and we have only barely highlighted who He really is, what a friend to have, isn't he? Again, let's look at the subject. Jesus is our friend and he proves it. He proves it in the fact that he was made a man and because of that he understands us totally and completely. We've already made mention of Philippians 2 verses 5 through 8. Look at verses 6 and 7. Who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of man. Folks, he has experienced everything that you and I have experienced. The list could be lengthy, but let's just look at a few points. He grew weary in his journey through Samaria. John 4 verse 6. We find that he was rejected by his friends. The Bible says that the apostles all forsook him and fled. Mark 14 verse 50. He was tempted just like you and I were tempted. And we read about one of those temptations in the wilderness in Matthew 4, 1 through 11. He was doubted by his own family, John 7 verse 5. And my friends, 
He knows what it is like to experience a cruel, agonizing death. The Bible simply puts this, and He was crucified. Mark 15, verse 25. Jesus knows what it's like to live as a human being. He knows all of the weaknesses of the flesh. He knows everything that can bring hardship, that can bring sorrow, that can bring despair into an individual's life. There is absolutely nothing that you and I experience that He does not understand. Therefore, He can occupy the position of high priest in the kingdom of God. You see, He is God, but He is also man. Therefore, He can be our go-between, can He not? He knows what it's like to be God, but He also knows exactly what it's like to be a human being. The Bible says, For we have not an high priest, which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Hebrews 4, verse 15. Notice, He was what? He knows the feeling of our infirmities. Anything you are experiencing, anything that you need, anything through which you are going, any way that you have been treated, Jesus understands. And folks, that's a wonderful thought because you and I can go boldly under the throne of grace with every request that we could possibly ask. Notice what the Bible says. Let us therefore come boldly under the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. We have an individual by the name of Jesus who came to this earth, experienced everything that you and I have experienced, and now He sits between us and God in order to mediate on our behalf. Why? Because He understands. That's a friend, isn't it? Secondly, Jesus is our friend and proves it because He taught so that you and I can be like God, the Father. You know, there's a lot of children in our world who don't have dads. Oh yes, some man provided life to them. But He's not in their life. Those dads have left the home. They've rejected their children. They've refused to take care of them. Folks, those children, many of them live hard, difficult lives. Can you imagine a father leaving his son, telling him by to never see him again? And yet, that dad goes out into the world and he becomes prosperous and he becomes successful and he becomes wealthy in his pursuit in life and yet he's left his son behind. He could have stayed at home. And he could have taught that little boy everything that he knows. And He could have been there with Him to help Him and to assist Him and to mentor Him. And that little child, rather than living in despair, could have lived a life of marvelous success if only His dad had been there to teach Him. Folks, the Bible tells us that God wants us to be just like Him. Doesn't it? Look at just one verse, Matthew 5, verse 48. Be therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. Our question is this. How? How in the world can you and I do that? 
How can we be like the Father which is in heaven? And folks, the answer to that is this. Jesus shows us how, doesn't He? You see, He teaches us. First, He teaches us by His Word. Notice Colossians 3.10. And have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of Him that created Him. There's three points in that verse. Number one, you and I have put on a new man. If you're a Christian, your old man of sin died, did it not? And you put on a new man. You put on, in fact, Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. Notice that that new man is renewed, but how? In knowledge. Every day, you and I as Christians are getting better and better and better and better. Why? Because we're renewed in the knowledge of God's Word. And notice what that does. That causes us to be created in His image. Folks, every day of our lives, we ought to be more like Jesus Christ. But notice too, Jesus not only taught through His words, He also taught by His example, did He not? Over and over in Scripture, He exhorts us to follow His example. One of those is John 3, verse 35. I have given you an example that ye should do as I have done unto you. Jesus wants us to look at His life, look how He lived, and pattern our life after Him. And there are so many areas, aren't there? He wants me to follow Him in servitude, in prayer, in compassion. He wants me to follow Him in confronting error, in training other individuals, in submission to the Father, and even in death. He is our example. Some might ask this question though. How does being like Jesus... Make us like the Father. And the answer to that is given in John, the 14th chapter, verses 8 and 9. A discussion was being had between Jesus and the apostles. And Philip, on this particular occasion, asked a question. He says this, or states this, Lord, show us the Father. You remember Jesus' reply? If ye have seen me... Ye have seen the Father. Folks, that's how much alike Jesus and the Father are. They are identical. They're not the same being, but they are identical. Now think about that. You and I can become like Jesus, and Jesus is identical to who? To the Father. If you and I are like Jesus, then guess what? There is no doubt that we are just like the Father which is in heaven. Jesus has given every one of us the ability to be like the Father in heaven. What a friend we have in Jesus. Number three, He died on the cross of Calvary so that we can be forgiven. Folks, in the high court of the Almighty God, the sentence against sin is very simple. It's this, the soul that sinneth, it shall die. When it comes to paying the price for sin, there is one of two ways for man to do that. I can do it individually if I so desire. If I want to die in my sins and suffer the punishment for those sins in a devil's hell, I have that choice, don't I? Or, I can allow another to die for me. And that other is none other than Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Listen to Ephesians 5.2. And walk in love, even as Christ hath also loved us, and hath given Himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice for a sweet-smelling savor. Did you hear what He just said? Folks, Jesus loved us enough 
to be an offering and a sacrifice to God on our behalf. The Bible tells us that it was Jesus who paid the debt for our sins. Look at the opening words of Isaiah 53 verse 11. He shall see the travail of his soul and shall be what? Satisfied. We see Jesus on Golgotha. Those Roman soldiers fold his arms out. And nail him to that tree, don't they? They lift him up, they nail his feet to that tree as well, and there he is, writhing in anguish and writhing in pain. God from heaven is looking down, and the Bible says, God sees the travail of his soul and is satisfied. The debt for Victor Eskew's sins have been paid. What a friend. You see, our friend was willing to die so that we can be forgiven. Now folks, listen to me. In order to obtain that forgiveness, the only thing that we have to do is obey what's found in the gospel of Jesus Christ. All we have to do is abide by the instructions found in the Word of God and we can be forgiven. Three key acts. Number one, faith. Peter stood before the council in Acts 15 verse 9 and he says this, and put no difference between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile any longer. There is no difference between any two human beings any longer. All men can have their hearts purified how? By faith. Anybody who puts the word only on faith has added to the word of God. That's not what it says. But we are purified by faith. Faith is an absolute essential in the plan of God and in the forgiveness of sins. But there's another step, and it's referred to as repentance. Acts 5, verse 31. The Bible tells us that God hath exalted Him with His own right hand and made Him to be a prince and a savior to give, listen to Him, repentance unto Israel and the forgiveness of sins. My friends, until a man repents... He will never be forgiven of his iniquity. Salvation is not by faith only. Salvation involves repentance in addition to an individual's faith. A man must die to his sins, die to his old way of living. And there is also baptism. The denominational world says, oh, baptism is not essential to salvation. Baptism doesn't save. Folks, I want you to listen to what the Bible says. Peter on the day of Pentecost said, Repent. I find that interesting. That's what we just said. He told those Jews on the day of Pentecost who were already believers, You repent and be baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. Acts 2 verse 38. Saul of Tarsus heard the word of God on the road to Damascus. He was in a penitent state when Ananias arrived. And what was he told? And now why tarriest thou? Rise and be baptized and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Acts twenty two sixteen. Our Lord has died so that we can be forgiven. But He says, in order to obtain that forgiveness, you must believe, you must repent, and you must be immersed into Christ for the forgiveness of sins. Folks, then and Only then are you cleansed of your iniquities. You see, Jesus is our friend and died to forgive us. What a friend we have in Jesus. Notice this next point. He conquered our enemies so that you and I can be victorious. We've talked about this in our study of Revelation. Nobody in their right mind 
wants to be on the losing team. Do you? I don't. I remember playing football, basketball, baseball. And I remember being on the losing team. That ain't where I really wanted to be. I coached a little girl's softball team once. They never expected that we would be in the finals, and right there we were. If we won the first game, we were the victors. We lost. So we had to play game number two. And we lost. That's not a happy story. We lost. Oh, Jesus doesn't want us to lose. And therefore He came to conquer our enemies. John 16, verse 33. In the world you should have tribulation. Be of good cheer. I have what? I have overcome the world. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 15, 57, And God be thanked that we have victory where? In Christ Jesus our Lord. Colossians 2, 5 tells us that Jesus has spoiled principalities and powers and has made an open show of them, triumphing over them in it. We are told also in Hebrews 2, verse 14, That Jesus hath destroyed him that hath the power of death. That is the devil. Listen to those phrases again. I have overcome the world. Victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Triumphing over them in it. And destroyed the devil through his death. Jesus has conquered our enemies. Why? So that you and I can be victorious. Because of what He has done, you and I will reign with Him forever and ever and ever and ever in the hereafter. Listen to Revelation 22.5. And there is no night there. They need no candle, neither the light of the sun, for the Lord God giveth them light. And they reign, what? Forever and ever. Because of what Jesus has done, every one of us will be elevated to high, lofty positions in the hereafter and reign with Him throughout all eternity. Notice next. He left to prepare a place for us And one of these days, He's coming back, isn't He? Forty days after our Lord was raised from the dead, He ascended back to the right hand of the Father. We have that account in Acts 1, verses 9 through 11. However, before He left, He made a promise to His disciples, didn't He? Oh yes, He told them that I'm leaving, but listen to the promise that He made them. I go and prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. That where I am, there ye may be also. I want you to think about this. He left. And He hasn't returned. He left. And He hasn't returned. It's been 2,000 years. And he hasn't come back. You hear those next words? He will. How do you know that, Vic? I know that because what Peter teaches us in 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 7 through 10. Folks, right now, the world is laid by in store. Listen to what Peter says reserved unto fire against the day of judgment of what? ungodly men. Right now the world is laid by in store. It's in reserve. Oh yes, it's been a long time. It's been that way for 2,000 years. But that's not a big deal to God. Because Peter says, a day is with the Lord as a thousand years. And a thousand years as one day. As far as God is concerned, He made that promise two days ago. 
Even though it's been 2,000 years, it's only been two days as far as God is concerned. It doesn't matter how much time passes. God's Word is true, folks. If we're good, faithful Christians, we want Him to come back now, don't we? Come back now. Come back right now. Come back any time. But folks, He doesn't. Why? Because there are some men that He desires to repent. Doesn't He? And that's why He withholds not coming back to this earth, but the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, the Bible says. He's coming. There are no ifs, ands, or buts about it. And folks, when He comes, guess what He's going to do? He's going to grab us and He's going to take us to glory with Him, isn't He? 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17. For the Lord Himself shall ascend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught together with them in the clouds to meet Him in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Folks, when our Lord comes, whether you are dead or alive, guess what? You will rise to meet Him in the air and you'll be there forever and ever and ever with Him and He will take you to that place that He's been preparing for you since He left. True friends are known by the proof of their love. Folks, Jesus was made a man in order to understand us and be our go-between with God the Father. Jesus has taught us by His Word and by His example so that every one of us can be just like the Father. Jesus died on the hill of Calvary in order that each one of us can be forgiven. He conquered our enemies so that one day you and I can reign with Him forever and ever and ever. And Jesus has left and He's gone to prepare for us a place and one of these days He's going to come again and take us to where He is. And we will never leave that home. I'm sure that Every one of us have got some friends who have done some pretty wonderful things for us. Sometimes I'm just amazed at the stories, aren't you? About what other people can do for a friend. We could write an encyclopedia probably. Now folks, listen to me. Only Jesus, only Jesus could do the things for us spiritually that needed to be done. Nobody else could do it. And guess what? He did. You see, Jesus is a best friend. And He's proved it over and over and over again. And what I find interesting is this. All He asks is for us to be His friends in return. That's all He asks. Is that a big deal? Somebody who has done all of these wonderful things and all He says is, all I want you to do, all I want you to do is be my friend in return. Now listen to me, folks. You're not a friend of Jesus just because you say you are. Mouthing the words, I'm a friend of Jesus, doesn't necessarily make it so. Remember what we said at the outset of this lesson? In order to be a friend, there must be what? Proof of friendship. And Jesus has told us exactly what that proof is. Ye are my friends, if ye do 
whatsoever I command you. All He wants is your friendship and the proof of that friendship in return. As you look at your life, can you honestly say, I'm striving to be as obedient unto God as I possibly can. I'm doing the will of the Almighty. I want to be a friend to my friend, Jesus Christ. We noted that He died for us to be forgiven, right? Maybe there's some here who, yes, you believe. Maybe you've even repented of sins. You've quit that old way of sin, but you have yet to acknowledge that faith by confessing Jesus and being buried with Him in the waters of baptism for the forgiveness of sins. Folks, you can't be taught wrong and baptized right. You know that? You have to understand that baptism was for the forgiveness of my transgressions. Dear Christian, are you living your life as a friend of Jesus? We sang the song that acknowledges that we want to be friends, but is our life a life of obedience or not? Maybe there's a disobedience, a sin that you need to take care of and ask God to forgive you. Do you need to respond? Won't you come? as we stand and sing.